Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So, last class we were talking about grading interferometers, and we were talking about the fact that they could made, uh, be made achromatic. And uh, this is always something that's a little bit difficult to, uh, to understand, I know. So let's uh, uh, just go through a little bit of what we talked about last class, and then we'll go on to, to new material. So if we think about interfering, um, say we have two point sources, Young's two pinhole experiment. If we keep the spacing of the pinholes fixed and we increase the wavelength, what do we know about the fringe spacing? It increases, right. If I, if I were to uh, take the separation between the two pinholes, and if I were to increase the separation, uh, what happens to the fringe spacing? Does it increase or decrease? So the separation between the two pinholes, we increase. The fringe spacing becomes, well, it becomes smaller. The fringe spacing is really determined by the angle between the two beams and the wavelength. But for a given wavelength, it depends on the angle between the two beams. In the limit where the two beams are parallel, we have one fringe. And if I increase the angle between the two beams, I'm going to get more and more fringes. Fringes are going to get closer together. And so in a two pinhole experiment, if I increase the separation between the two pinholes, the angles between the two beams will increase and the fringe spacing will decrease. Spatial frequency will increase. So increasing wavelength makes the, the uh, fringe spacing smaller. If we increase the separation between the two pinholes, it will make the fringe spacing smaller. And uh, so, if we make the fringe, or the, the spacing between the two pinholes proportional to the wavelength, then all the different wavelengths will give the same frequency of fringes, same spacing of fringes. Okay. And that, the nice thing about a grating here is that due to diffraction here, say we have a point source right here, and if we look at the only the plus and minus first orders, we'll see that as we increase the wavelength, the separation, and, and I look back in here, and from the first and second orders, it looks like, you know, I have virtual sources up here for the plus one order and the minus one order. And the separation between these virtual sources will increase with wavelength. And so it will end up at the fringe spacing I get out here by interfering these, this plus one and minus one orders will be independent of wavelength. The zero order fringe, if I look, say I just look at the blue light here, and I, I put this line here that is um, bisecting um, for this. If I look along this line, that's going to be the zero order fringe because the path from here to a given point is equal to the path from this to the same point. So a zero order fringe will be along here. And because of the way the diffraction works here, you know, the plus one and minus one orders, the zero order fringe for all the wavelengths is along here, along this line. So not only do we get the case where all the different wavelengths give the same spacing of the fringes, but the location of the fringes is the same for all the wavelengths. And so we, you know, if I, if I had a white light source here, I would get nice fringes here that would be white and, and black. Everything is lined up, all the different wavelengths are lined up. So do you sort of understand how this works? And then we'll go to a more complicated case. 
Okay. So now let's go to a little more complicated case, and that's the two-frequency grading that we talked about in the uh, last class. We were using this for lateral shear. So remember, we had two different line spacings here. So if I had a source here illuminating that, I would have two plus one orders, one for each line spacing. And the numbers I would using, I think, were spatial frequencies like 200 lines per millimeter and 220 lines per millimeter. There's nothing magic about those numbers, but they, uh, just some typical numbers we could use. So I'll say they're 200 and 220. So now if I look at the first orders here, and I'm only going to look at the plus one order in this case. And so a source here, after being diffracted, after light being diffracted by this grating, is going to appear to be coming from down here. And again, the diffraction distance here, or angle, is proportional to the wavelength. And so the, the blue might be down here, and the red would be down a little bit further. Now I have two gratings, and so I have two sets of orders here. I mean, I have two frequencies here, so two sets of orders. So I'd have like a blue and a red, and then down here be another blue and another red. So the separation of the first orders of the two gratings is proportional to the wavelength. And so once again, we're going to get all the different wavelengths are going to give us the same frequency fringes. So that's nice. But the thing that is wrong here is that the midpoint, if say I have the, the two blue spots here and then I have the two red spots here, the midpoint between the two blue spots and the midpoint between the two red spots will be different. And so while I get the same frequency grading, the uh, same frequency fringes here, they're going to be shifted relative to one another. Different colors will be shifted. And we can fix that by putting in another grading here. And if these are, say, 200 and 220 lines per millimeter, we want this to be the average of those two, or 210 lines per millimeter. So that will take these spots here and make it symmetrical again. Uh, since it's a higher frequency than the low frequency here, those orders are going to end up on this side. And it's a lower frequency than the higher frequency there, so the other orders will still be on this side. So it's going to be like this here. So it goes back being symmetrical again, just like what we had over here. And so if I take this two frequency grading and I put in another grading here, as I say, it's the average frequency of this of these two frequencies here, then I will end up with something like this, and I'll get nice white light interference fringes. And I'll show you a picture of, of that in just a second. In fact, I'll, do it. I'll skip ahead and do it right now. So that's what we have on, on the left here. This was using a point source, white light point source, and the fringes indeed were black and white. I mean, I could have taken this picture using color film, and I still would have the, the black and white fringes like this. OK? So this is one example of an achromatic interferometer. The fringes are the same frequency for independent of wavelength, and the location of the fringes is independent of wavelength. And if you go back and look in the literature, you'll see other examples of uh, achromatic interferometers, but um, the ones that I know about them, certainly the most popular ones, all use diffraction gratings. The other thing is that you can also make a system that will work with an extended source, certain type of extended source anyway. And so this is supposed to be a, a picture of, a, of a, an extended source. And if you go back to my, what I always refer to as my favorite uh, theorem, the Van Sudek-Zernike theorem, which says uh, the coherence function, uh, the spatial coherence, the coherence function 
is given by the Fourier transform of the um, source distribution. And so if we have a, uh, an extended source that is really periodic, so this is like taking a source, I'll put a ronky ruling in front of it, something, so it's a periodic um, distribution. Uh, Fourier transform of that will also be periodic. And so if I use this source, and if I then have a, a shearing interferometer where the shear, and so I have some coherence function associated with that source here. Uh, and so that is saying that um, if I have a shearing interferometer with essentially no shear, well, okay, then I have good coherence between the two interfering beams, but it's not of much interest. But from the Fourier transform of this, you can find out that there's another peak in this coherence function. And so if I have a shear that would correspond to this distance here, then I still would have good contrast fringes. I still would have good coherence. And so it, it also, if you go through the Van Sudrick-Zernicke theorem, it turns out that this shear that you want, if you change the wavelength, the amount of shear you want is also proportional to the, to the wavelength. And so if I have a, a periodic white light extended source, I can get good contrast fringes with a shearing interferometer a grading type shearing interferometer, similar to what I just showed, where, um, you know, the, if I have the shear just the right distance here, and if the shear is proportional to the wavelength, then I can also get good uh, contrast fringes. And that's what this last one, uh, I mean, the fringes are not as good contrast as here, but this was obtained using a, well, actually a 60 watt light bulb with a, a Ronke ruling. Um, in front of it. So anyway, I always found this kind of interesting that you can do interferometry, uh, shearing interferometry, in particular with white light and with extended sources if you, if, uh, you use some type of a grading type uh, interferometer. So anyway, that's all I wanted to, to say about this. Question? You could use it to test optics, and there may be easier ways of doing it, but you, we have used that for testing optics. Um, we, well, it's, it's using a shearing interferometer, and um, uh, if you want to, um, to use a white light source, um, I mean, you can, it will work with that. Uh, where, where we first got involved using this was in uh, adaptive optics, where we were trying to uh, measure atmospheric turbulence. And uh, we wanted to use a star as uh, the light source. And we could have put in a, a spectral filter, but we never had enough light. And so we ended up, we wanted to be able to use all of the, the light we had without using a spectral filter. So we, we went to the grading type interferometer where we, we could work with, um, with uh, uh, white light anyway. And then at the same time, we were, we were looking at some other applications where it might be convenient to have an extended source. And so we were looking at whether we could do that or not. There are, I mean, I say we, we did this. There are quite a number of papers if you go to particular applied optics, you'll find quite a number of papers on these achromatic uh, grading interferometers. Now, I don't know if they've had a lot of, of uh, maybe not a lot of commercial application, um, but they're certainly kind of interesting, interesting to look at, and uh, they, work, they work very well. No, well, you'd illuminate the, I mean, the optic would be illuminated with some um, white light source, and then you'd use, you would, uh, after the light went through or reflected off of the optics, then you would use a shearing interferometer to, to measure the, 
uh, the wavefront. So shearing interferometers are, um, I mean, they're, they're nice, but they're, they're giving you the slope, or something close to the slope of the wavefront anyway. They're giving you the average value of the slope over the shear distance. And um, you'd like to have some type of analysis. So I thought I would go through here. I'll, I'll mention a couple of ways of doing the analysis of uh, uh, lateral shearing interferometers. And I'm going to, to keep it as simple as possible. I'm going to do one dimensional. But um, both techniques I'm talking about here will work equally well you know, in two dimensions. Um, so let's say I have an interferogram, a lateral shear interferogram, and um, I want to determine the, uh, the wavefront. And if the shear is really small, uh, then what we're getting is essentially the derivative of the wavefront. And so what I could do is I take the shearing interferogram and I could fit that uh, to a uh, the fringe positions to a polynomial. And then I could integrate that polynomial to get the wavefront. Well, the problem is that normally your shear is larger, uh, large enough that you can no longer say it's exactly a derivative. You're not measuring exactly, you're measuring something close to a derivative, but not exactly a derivative. And so I want to be able to analyze these interferograms um, even for, for larger amounts of shear. And so one approach that, and this will work both for large shear and small shear, is that we're going to take, well, the wavefront difference function. If I look at, you know, the, that lateral shear interferogram uh, and I get some fringes, so I, I'm, I'm taking the wavefront, I'm comparing it with itself shifted sideways, a small difference. And I'm saying that what I measure there, I'm going to call that the wavefront difference function. So it's not the wavefront, and it's not quite the derivative of the wavefront, but it's going to be the wavefront difference function is what the shearing interferogram is giving me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit the wavefront difference function to a polynomial. And then I'm going to set up what I'm going to call the finite difference, wavefront difference function. And I'll show you in the next slide just what I, what I mean by that. But I'm going to uh, take the wavefront difference function that I measure. I'm going to uh, set, and I'm going to fit that to a polynomial. And I'm going to set that polynomial equal to what I'm going to call the finite difference, wavefront difference function. And then I will solve for the polynomial coefficients describing the wavefront in terms of the polynomial coefficients describing the wavefront difference function. Okay, so what am I, what am I saying there? Well, let's say that this is the um, interferogram I'm getting. So you can, sh you can see I have a fair amount of shear here. And um, um, this pattern here then, I mean, this is, well, if I, if I just look at this and remembering that this is from the shearing interferometer, um, what aberration do I expect to end up with? Just looking at that. Spherical, yeah. It probably, there's going to be some defocus there. Because if I look here, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, a, uh, I've added a such amount of defocus that I have the same fringe going around here that I have going through the center. So I'm going to have spherical aberration with some defocus. So this is my interferogram. And uh, this is the wavefront difference function. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to one dimensional case. I'm just going to draw a line across here. And I'm going to see where the fringes cross that line. And I'm going to set that equal to a, um, I'm going to fit that to a polynomial. And it's a polynomial that's going to go as some coefficient b times x to the n. And uh, n right now is going to go from 0 to some number minus 1. I'll 
say n max minus 1. Now the wave front I could write here as some a's times x to the n, where now the n's here go from 1 to n max. So, you know, this is close to a derivative of this. And so um, uh, the, the uh, exponents here would be go from 1 to n max, and down here the, everything would be reduced by 1, so it's going to go from 0 to n max minus 1. So this is the wave front. And what I want to do then, I mean, I want to solve for what the wave front is. So I want to solve for all of these a's. Okay. And I'm going to fit this polynomial here to this wave front difference function. And I will, when I do the fitting process, I'll, I'll determine all the b's. So really what I want to do is determine these a's in terms of these b's here. Now, the, the true wavefront difference function, well, if the wavefront I write one-dimensionally, I'm just going to write it as a x to the n. And so I'm saying, a, a, let's say the shear here is capital delta. So I can think, I'm going to do this symmetrically. I'm going to move one beam over to the left, amount capital delta over 2. And I'll move the other beam over to the right, a distance capital delta over 2. So what I'm really measuring is the wavefront here. Well, the difference between the wavefront shifted to the left and the wavefront shifted to the right. And so this is what I'm really measuring here, is this a sub n x to delta over 2 minus uh, x minus delta over 2 to the n. Okay. So what I'm going to do then, I'm going to fit this to the wavefront difference function, solve for the b's, and um, then I'm going to set that equal to what I have down here and solve for the a's in terms of the b's. And if I do that, what I'll get is that um, for the a's I'll have something like that, and the b's I'll get something like that. Um, a's, b's, a's. Well, if I have a, an A here, then I'm going to get these Bs here. And if I had just done a simple integration, I would have gotten only the first terms. But because I'm, I have a finite difference rather than a derivative, I get these other terms in here. So going over here, this is just fitting the data to the interferogram, that's a wavefront difference function. And then if I simply go through and solve for the a's in terms of the b's, I'm going to get this right here. This is my wavefront. And if I want to subtract the tilt out, well, this is the wavefront minus the tilt. Oops. And if I say, well, this, you know, this has some third-order spherical, or I call it here fourth-order, but um, third-order spherical uh, plus some defocus. And if I remove the defocus, this is the third-order spherical that I would have. OK? So we fit that to a polynomial, looking at this data. And then we set that equal to this down here and solve for the a's in terms of the b's. And we get this, and we end up with our final result here. And that was just one dimension, but we could, we could do the same thing in, in two dimensions. We'd have to have two lateral shear interferograms because we have to have shear in the two orthogonal directions. So that's one approach, and there are a few approaches that you read in the literature, but that's one that, that uh, I've used, and uh, it works pretty well, and it's pretty easy to extend it to two dimensions. Well, the next slide, uh, I'm going to show the shack approach to this. And unfortunately, none of you ever, you didn't have the great experience of having shack for 
for a professor. I didn't either, but I had him for a colleague. Uh, and Shaq was very clever, and he would he would come up with uh, uh, what I would say very novel, novel techniques. Um, of course, then he'd never publish them, so no one know about them. But uh, his students would know about them. And so <clears throat> this is Shaq's approach, and I, I think this I, I've never actually used this myself, but I think it's just clever, very very clever. So what Shaq says, let's think about this for a second. So our interferogram is our wavefront difference function. And so remember, that's just finding the difference between the wavefront and the wavefront shifted sideways some distance. Okay. So Shaq says, well, the wavefront difference function can be thought of as convolving the wavefront with two delta functions, one positive and one negative. And these two delta functions would, would be shifted, would be separated by the shear distance. So let's think about that. I mean, this, this is the whole s secret to his process right there. So remember, we're finding the, the difference between the wavefront and the wavefront shifted sideways. So as he says, that can be thought of as a convolution of the wavefront with two delta functions, one positive and one going negative, separated by the shear distance. So will you buy that first, first bullet here? Because that's the whole thing that his idea is based on. The rest, the rest is pretty simple once you think of, once you think of that first bullet. Okay, so that's what the wavefront difference function is. So let's take the Fourier transform of that. Well, the Fourier transform of a convolution you learned is a product of two Fourier transforms. So it's a product <coughs> of the Fourier transform of the wavefront with the Fourier transforms of these two delta functions. And so if I think here, I take the Fourier transform of the wavefront difference function. I'll divide that by the Fourier transform of the two delta functions, which is just 2i times the sine function. Well, the sign depends on the, the, the separation between the two delta functions. So I'll divide that out and do a, then I'll do an inverse Fourier transform. Now I'll get the wavefront back. So we just take the Fourier transform of the wavefront difference function and <coughs> we'll divide that by this 2i sine and do an inverse Fourier transform. Now, the one thing you might say, well, um, uh, our places where this sine will go to zero, and I'm dividing by zero, so that's not a good thing to do. And so what we're doing, I mean, that we just throw away those points. Well, and so we're missing certain frequencies. But if you think for a second, when I'm doing, I'm finding the, the wavefront, the difference between the wavefront and the wavefront shifted, there are, there's a frequency, I'll say a period or something, which is equal to the shear distance, that I'm missing. If I had an aberration of that frequency, or that, the same period as the shear, I would miss that information. And so that's really when we're throwing away the point, so this sign goes to zero. We're just missing that information in the interferogram anyway. So it works pretty well. Well, Shaq never, never published this, of course, but he had um, a student, Ron Grunzel, who I, I think did this for his master's thesis. And um, he, um, he published it. For some reason, he didn't put Shaq's name on it, but he published it. And so you can find the description. And it's been, there are a few other places in the literature where it's mentioned, but uh, it hasn't, hasn't been used a lot. I'm not sure why. It's a pretty, pretty simple uh, way of analyzing shearing interferograms. So final comments <coughs> on lateral shear interferometers. Advantages and disadvantages. Well, the advantages, 
Well, it's a simple test. Almost always it's a pretty simple test. You don't have to worry about bringing in some reference beam to interfere. Uh, you don't have to worry about reference optics. You just interfere with the beam with itself. And so the test is simple. The disadvantage, maybe I should have broken this into two separate ones. One disadvantage is that it doesn't give you the wavefront directly. It's giving you something close to the slope of the wavefront, giving you the wavefront difference function, close to the slope. Um, and so you have to go through some type of uh, close to integration to get back to what the wavefront is. And the second disadvantage is that for a single direction of shear, we're measuring the slope in only one direction. And so if I'm testing something that's not rotationally symmetric, then I'm going to have to do two shearing interferograms. And generally, you, you do two where the shears are at 90 degrees to one another. So there was, there was a time in my life for a period of a year, a year and a half, the only thing I thought about was lateral shear interferometers. For some reason, I just got so excited about them and uh, had a lot of fun. And, um, uh, and again, if you, if you look in the literature, you'll find out that I'm not the only one who's gotten very excited about them. There's lots and lots of papers on uh, lateral shear interferometers. And as I showed you, you can make it work with white light. You can even make it work in special cases with extended sources. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of fun to play with. So any questions on lateral shear before we go on? OK. Another type of shearing interferometer that people talk about a lot is radial shear. I don't know why. Sometimes when I do that, it shows up very weird on my computer. It looks OK on the screen, but I just go off it and come back, and it's OK. So this is going to be radial shear interferometer. And again, there are a zillion of these radial shear interferometers. But one that's kind of easy is just to, easy to see is to take a Mach Zender here. And we're going to put a telescope in, in both arms. And um, it's going to make one of the beams larger. And it's going to make one of the beams smaller. So coming out here, we have a large beam, and we have a small beam. And, it, and so if we kind of look at the end here, this is what we have. We have the large beam, and we have the small beam. And in the region of overlap here, we're going to see uh, interference fringes. And so you can see why this is radial shear. Okay. And the radial shear, we'll call R, and uh, Half the papers on radial shear will define R as S1 over S2. And the other half of the papers on radial shear interferometers will define R as S2 over S1. But um, anyway, I'll write here as S1 over S2, the smaller over the larger. Doesn't matter which way you write it. And so it's kind of interesting. And what so what types of interference fringes do we get here? And um, can we some way relate that back to um, the wavefront? Because we're measuring something like the slope here, but it's kind of complicated. I mean, um, the shear at the center is zero, and then the shear, if I think about it, the shear gets larger as we move out. And so right at the edge here, the, you know, we have a fair amount of shear. If we come in here, it's less shear and so on. So it's a little more of a different creature than what what we um, had before. And so one way you can write this, and I think uh, you know, if we go back to Malachara, I, th I think Malachara's PhD dissertation was on radial shear uh, interferometers. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I think, I think I saw his dissertation once. I think it was. And I think, um, so I think what I'm writing here is something that was, came out of his dissertation from a long, long time ago, even before I went to graduate school. So um, we could say the wavefront is something rho squared, rho to the fourth, and then we could we can put in some what, some coma, and we can put in some astigmatism, and so on. And so if I exp 
oh, if I expand the beam, um, I could just write it the same way, but um, I'll, I'll make it r times rho. So r, remember, this was our, our radial shear. And as I've defined r, um, r is less than, less than 1 here. So it could be um, r times rho here. And so we're going to take the difference between, well, two beams of different sizes. And so I can say, well, we're going to take the difference between this and this. And so I just write that down here. That's the difference between the two. And um, um, so we get something that goes as rho squared times 1 minus r squared, a rho to the fourth times 1 minus r to the fourth, and so on. And so we see that we get the same thing as what we had with a Twyman green if we divide each coefficient here by a 1 minus r to the n, where n is the, the power of rho. Okay. And so we can write here that, you know, if we have a large shear, um, so I guess for a large, a large shear here, the way I've written it, uh, r would become very small. So 1 minus r to the n would become almost 1. And so for a large shear, the results are the same as for a Twyman green. If we have a small shear, so for a small shear, r is almost equal to 1. For a small shear, we really don't have much, we don't have much sensitivity. So it's a very low sensitivity test. Okay. So um, if, if you go to my, my website and look at the, the uh, web Mathematica portion of the website, you can uh, create interferograms like what you would get with a lateral shear interferometer. You can create interferograms like what you would get with a, a radial shear interferometer. And then there's two other types of shearing interferometers I think I have up there. One is a rotational shear interferometer. So you can kind of guess what that is. It's just taking the beam and comparing it or interfering it with itself, but rotate it a little bit. Um, how might you rotate a wavefront? Can anyone give me it? So, uh, you know, I could have some interferometer. Away. Well, one way is a, a dove prism. If you send the light through a dove prism and rotate the dove prism, you rotate the wavefront. So anyway, so you could have a, a rotational shear interferometer. I'm not sure what the value of one is, but you can generate the interferograms up on my website. And then the other thing I show, I guess, is for a flip interferometer, flip shear. So you take the wavefront, and for the second beam, you just flip it over. Maybe x, you know, shift, flip it over in the x direction, or maybe in the y direction, or, or maybe both x and y. And so you can kind of play with that. And um, so we, we have at least those four different types of shearing interferometers. But of the four, I think the lateral shear has, is the one that um, is most widely, most widely used. So any questions on that? OK, so we, we talked about testing of flat surfaces. We talked about testing of spherical surfaces, and that this completes our discussion of spherical surfaces. So I'll close that. So what should we talk about next? Flats, spheres, ah, a spheres. We'll talk about a spheres next. Okay. So. Um, what we'll talk about here is we're going to describe aspheric surfaces. And we did a little bit of that before in the aberration chapter. Um, 
So we'll, we'll do that. Then we're going to talk about what we call null tests. And these are going to be tests, uh, all of these are going to be, for the null test, everything is an interferometric test. And they're going to be tests such that when the optics we're testing, aspheric optics, when it's perfect, we're going to get straight equally spaced ranges. So that's why we call it null tests. And then after that, we'll go on and we'll talk about non-null tests. And some of these are uh, interferometric and some are not. And um, um, so we have, what, 11 of these that we'll go through and, and talk about, some in, some in more detail than, than others. And things like the lateral shear and radial shear would just kind of repeat a little bit of what we just said. And then the other ones are different. And um, so let's first say a little bit about aspheric surfaces. And um, uh, the really aspheric surfaces have become very, very uh, interesting to people um, for several reasons. One is if we don't restrict ourselves just to having spherical surfaces, we probably can get some better, better performance, improved performance. And um, we can probably even get better performance with a smaller number of optical components. Ah, so that's kind of interesting. And if we can do that, we probably can get a smaller number of components, probably get reduced weight. Ah, that's kind of interesting. Smaller number of components, maybe we can even get lower cost. And so, you know, improved performance, reduced number of components, reduced weight, lower cost. How can you not like them? You know, certainly very important. And if I, if I go back to many, many years ago when I first taught uh, a version of this course, um, I had a quote from uh, Rudolf Kingslake that said something about, uh, you know, aspheric surfaces are a lot of interest, but no one knows how to make them. That quote's gone. People now, aspheric surfaces are made all the time. And I don't have my cell phone in my pocket, but I'm sure the lenses in that camera in my iPhone are aspheric. And they've just become very, very popular. And so if you're going to make aspheric surfaces, you have to be able to test them. And so this, this chapter is, is a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty important uh, chapter. Well, aspheres, some of them are conics. We'll look at examples of that. And some are, if they're not conics, they're, they're close to being conics. And so we want to first say a few words about conics. And again, I think we mentioned this a little bit back in the... Um, when we talked about aberrations. So a couple of three of these slides may be the same as what you've seen before. So this is our, our basic equation for uh, a conic. And our S squared here is just the uh, X squared plus Y squared. So that's the, the uh, distances or coordinates in the, in the pupil. We're saying the uh, Z axis is the axis of revolution. And K is this thing we call our conic constant. And R is what we call the, the vertex curvature. And so the whole thing about aspheric testing is that we want to measure Z as a function of X and Y and determine if, if Z is the right Z for the various X and Ys. So we can solve this equation for z and uh, uh, so this first part here would just be our normal uh, solution of the quadratic equation and so we could say that z is r minus the square root of this mess here over k plus one and that's a valid answer but it's not the way we normally see this written to get to the form we normally see it written, I'm going to multiply this by 1, where the 1 is going to be r plus the square root of 
r squared minus s squared times k plus 1 divided by the same thing. So this is just multiplying by 1. And when I multiply this out, um, uh, we're, we're going to get a, a term like this divided by a, a mess like that. But this will simplify a little bit here. Uh, our squares will cancel, and I can divide here by a, uh, a k plus 1, get rid of that, and then I have an r here that I can take out and put in this form here. And so the form that you normally see, the sag for a conic, is z is equal to s squared over r times 1 plus this square root of 1 minus k plus 1 times s over r squared, where again we keep remembering the s squared is x squared plus y squared. So this is the way you normally see the sag for a conic. And I just uh, took some curves here showing for what we'd have for different, <coughs> different conics here. I'll just look at a couple of them in a second. So if k is equal to 0, that's a sphere. And so this is just looking at our spherical surface right here. And if k is equal to minus 1, that's a parabola. And the thing I always like to remember, and I found I know, useful many times, is to think, well, this is my parabola here. The parabola is a little flatter than a sphere. And so if I were to send a beam of light in here and say this was a say these were mirrors, a beam of light here, the sphere would send it here, the parabola, a little flatter, would send it some farther distance away. Anyway, that turns out to be handy to remember at certain times that parabola is a little flatter than a sphere. So we said that this would be our sag for the conic. So z here, this is our, our sag here. And if I have an a-sphere, well, I can write that sag for the a-sphere is the sag for the conic plus some other terms here. And I've, I've written these other terms as rotationally symmetric, but that's really not, not true anymore. Often uh, you have non-rotationally symmetric terms out here, but... but um, for right now, I'm writing this as just a, a conic plus these other terms. And this is so the sag for an a-sphere. And uh, these a's are what we call the aspheric coefficients. And it may go out to s to the who knows what. It could be pretty high power. And as I said, this is only for rotationally symmetric a-spheres. And you could have other terms coming in here for non-rotationally symmetric a-spheres. OK, so the whole goal of this chapter here, again, I'll repeat, is to measure z here as a function of x and y and compare what we measure with theory or with what we want to see what the difference is. Now, some a-spheres are fairly easy to test, and some are terrible uh, to test. So what, what determines how difficult uh, uh, an A-sphere is to test? And so people, you know, they might, your boss might come to you and say, I, I have this A-sphere I want to test, and it departs from a sphere by um, 100 microns, let's say. Can you test it? And your answer should be, well, the answer is always yes. Your boss asks you if you can do something. The answer is yes, I can do it. But in your back of your mind, you say, hmm, you know, I, I need some more information. Can I, how do I, how do I do this test? And simply knowing that an A-sphere departs from a sphere by some amount doesn't give you the information, not only how to test it, but it doesn't even tell you how difficult it is to test. Sometimes, you know, it may be easy. Other times, it's oh, very difficult. 
And so what really determines how difficult it is is not how much departure you have from a sphere, but it's the slope of that departure. It's the slope that determines the difficulty. And so you really wanted your boss to say, well, I have a slope error, you know. It, the, the, this A sphere, the difference between this A sphere and the sphere is, you know, 100 microns with a maximum slope of, and then you want some slope number. And then, then maybe you can figure out whether you can test it, how easily you can test it or not. I always say you can test it, but how easily you can test it. If we think here, why, why do large slopes make a difference? You know, one problem is if I'm illuminating this, let's say it's a mirror, it could be the same problems with a lens, but let's say it's a mirror, and I'm reflecting light off of that mirror, if a slope is real large, who knows, the light's going to go off at some angle, and it won't even go back into my test setup. It just, you know, strikes it and goes someplace else. It doesn't even go back into my test setup. So that's, I mean, that's a real problem. If we're looking at an interferometric test, the slope is going to determine the spacing of the fringes. So even if the light gets back into my test setup, the fringes may be so close together that I have trouble resolving them. Maybe my detector, you know, detector doesn't have pixels, small enough pixels to even resolve the fringes. And so certainly for an interferometric test, the slope determines well, spacing of the fringes and determines how difficult it is to do the test. But even for a non-interferometric test, every test I've ever seen, the slope is really going to, to determine whether or how easily I can test it or not. So I have a little, a little plot here of optical path difference. So this is just plotting. Um, I used units here. Well, this is the radius of the part that I'm testing. And I normalize that to 1. So that's the radius. Semi-diameter, not radius of curvature, but semi-diameter normalized to 1. And then here, if I'm talking about um, the OPD, I I, instead of using microns or whatever for the uh, wavefront departure from a sphere, I wrote this in terms of fringes. How many fringes would I would I get um, just the departure between this a sphere and a circle surface? And so this has a maximum departure here of well something close to 300 fringes. Then I took the derivative of that, and so this is the slope. And so um, um, the slope was, is both negative and positive. Okay, so this is negative and positive. And the units I picked here, I, well, I could have picked arc seconds. And I, I can't remember. We probably talked about these crazy units of slope before, but let me try to sell, them, sell these units to you again. Instead of picking arc seconds, I picked slopes of, in this case, fringes per radius. So what that means is if I look at, say, this point right there, which is about, I don't know, 280 or so, says that if I had that slope, right here, that slope across the whole radius, that would give me 280 fringes. Or if I had this, this slope right there across the whole radius, that would give me 500 fringes. Now, do you remember, I, I think I talked about this before, you, you remember why I might use these crazy units instead of, say, arc seconds? Well, maybe I didn't tell you. I can't remember. I give so many short courses, sometimes I forget what I've told you and what I've told the uh, people in the short course. But um, The reason is simple. You know, if I used arc seconds for the slope, 
I mean, that would be fine. But now, if I change the size of the beam, the slope would change, too. You know, if I made the beam half as large in diameter, by using optics or whatever, made the beam half as large in diameter, the slopes would double. If I made it twice as large in diameter, the slopes would all reduce by a factor of two. And so, you know, you can always add optics to your test setup and make the beam smaller or larger. And so you can make the, the slopes and arc seconds smaller or larger. And so it's kind of, kind of confusing. But if I use these crazy units here, our fringes per radius, well, if I make the beam larger, the spacing of the fringes is going to become larger. But the beam is larger, so the number of fringes that I have across the whole beam would remain, would remain the same. And so if I use these crazy units here, fringes per radius, as the beam size changes, the slopes in fringes per radius will not change. OK? The slopes will not change. And so that's handy. So over the, over the years, I um, have grown to really like these units. So either fringes per radius or maybe, say, waves per radius. But uh, let's just stick with fringes per radius here. Um, and uh, it, it turns out to be a very convenient way of expressing slope. So any questions before we go on? OK. So that's a, a little bit about conics, a little bit about A spheres, and um, a little bit about what determines how difficult a, a test is to do. And so now what we want to do is we want to look at some of, these, some of these tests that we might do. And as I said, we're going to break it, our discussion, up into two sections here, null tests and non-null tests. And for null tests, uh, we just remember that when, whatever I'm testing, when the optics are perfect, when they're the, the shape I want, I'm going to end up with straight equally space fringes. Okay. And there are three um, null tests that we're going to talk about. Conventional null optics, which is a very, very common way of testing uh, A-spheres. Uh, strictly holographic null optics, which is not too common, but I, I talk about it only because it does take us to our third item, computer-generated holograms, which over the years has become extremely, extremely common. So conventional null optics and computer-generated holograms are the two most common null tests and sometimes they're used together. So let's think a little bit about null testing. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to have some interferometer, you know, a Twyman Green, a laser base for Zo, or, or something. And the idea is that we're going to have a, a reference surface. And we're going to have a, um, a test surface. In some way, we're going to put some optics in here or something. So not only does the beam ma match the reference surface, but the beam is going to match the test surface. And so we're going to get the reference and the test beams to have the same shape. And we're going to get a null fringe. Or if I introduce some tilt, I'll get my straight equally spaced fringes. So if I'm testing a mirror here, some way I'm adding something here. So when the rays get up to the mirror, all these rays are normal to the mirror surface. And they're going to come right back on themselves. And so there's going to be some optics or hologram or something in here that, that does that for us. Okay. So conventional null optics. Uh, so I'll, I'll show this for a laser-based fuzzo, but it 
you know, it could be any one of these interferometers. And here's the mirror I'm testing. And so this is an A-sphere. And if I take out the null optics here, pretend that's not there. If this, oops, excuse me, if this were a sphere, the beam would go up here, the beam, you know, the wavefront here would be, would match this surface here, all the rays would be normal, and the beam would come right back on itself. And that would interfere with our spherical beam coming from the reference surface. So that's true if this is a sphere. But if this is an aspheric surfaces, it's aspheric surface, you know, and if this is a spherical beam, the spherical beam is not going to match this aspheric surface. And so the beam will come back here and it won't be a sphere. When it interferes with the spherical reference, I'm going to get fringes. Maybe I can resolve them, maybe I can't, who knows. When we go to conventional null optics, what we're going to do is we're going to add some other optics in the setup. And these could be lenses, they could be mirrors, they could be a combination of lenses and mirrors. But the point is that they will take this spherical beam and produce an aspheric wavefront that will come right up here and match this aspheric mirror. And the beams will come, so all the rays will be normal here beam will come back on itself, go through this null optics, and come out here a spherical wave, which can then interfere with a spherical reference. And we'll get our null fringes, straight equally spaced fringes or single fringe. So the whole thing involves make, designing and making these null optics that will convert a spherical wave into a beam that matches the ACERM testing. This technique has been around since, I'm not sure how long, certainly since the, the 70s, maybe before that, maybe in the 60s even, I don't know. Um, and it, it can work extremely well. Do you know offhand the time that this failed and made the, maybe the most bad publicity for optical testing that ever has happened? The Hubble. <laughs> so they put the Hubble Space Telescope up and they expected to get very nice images and they got terrible, terrible images. And so uh, the question is what, what happened here? Well, what had happened was that they made all null optics, and the, the guy who designed the null optics, Abe Offner, was really a very good designer, and he designed wonderful null optics for doing this test. The null optics that he had consisted of lenses and mirrors, both. They fabricated the optics, they tested all the, the null optics, all the surfaces, you know, they were superb. Then they put the lenses and the mirrors together to produce this null optics. And when they put the optics together, they made a mistake that one of the spacings was off by a fraction of a millimeter. And so the beam that came out here was an aceric wavefront. And they made the mirror to match that aspheric wavefront. But unfortunately, because of the spacings, one spacing in particular in the null optics, um, the, um, it was the wrong aspheric wavefront. And so they made the primary mirror to the Hubble just the wrong shape. Now, they were, I mean, they were smart people doing it, and they, they actually had two tests. They had two sets of null optics. And, um, but for some reason, they, they, they really liked this one design better than the other design. And I think the other design had, a, had more glass in it, and they were a little worried about the quality of the glass, I think is what the story was. But anyway, they, they tested the Hubble using 
these two test setups, the null optics that they really liked and the null optics that they didn't like so much. And they got different results in the two tests. And, you know, they really should have looked at why did they have different results. But this was at a time, and I, probably no one in the class will understand what I'm saying here, but they were behind schedule and over budget. Does anyone? You, I'm sure you don't understand what I mean by that. But they were behind schedule and over budget. So the management said, well, you know, you, you really believe these, you know, these null optics. You really like these null optics that consisted of both the lens and the mirror. And so they're probably giving the right answer. So the mirror is done. Okay. And then when they put it up in space, it, of course, it turned out that uh, uh, we got images like this. So there was certainly a lot of publicity. And testing of A-spheres suddenly became uh, um, the headlines in the newspapers became very well known. And they uh, put together committees and stuff trying to, trying to figure out what, what the problem was. And you know, any of you know who the person was who actually figured out what the problem was? He, he worked here for a number of years. Bob Perks is his name. He worked, uh, he may still be working here part time. But anyway, Bob was the, the guy who who uh, really figured out just what, uh, what the particular problem was. So once they knew what the problem was, and they said, well, now we can, we'll make some correcting optics. And uh, uh, so they made the correcting optics. They hired some astronauts who went up there and, and put the, collecting, uh, the correcting optics in, in place. And uh, the lousy images like this became images like this. And you've all seen, uh, the, I mean, the really beautiful results that, that, that came from the, from the Hubble. I think, uh, I mean, this was a, an embarrassing thing. Um, uh, you know, the, the other thing that was kind of sad was that there were two primary mirrors made, one by Perkin Elmer and one by Kodak. And it was a Perkin Elmer primary mirror that had the problem. And it turns out that the backup primary mirror made by Kodak was fine. But it was sitting in some warehouse in probably Rochester, New York, and uh, was not used. But there were some good things that came out of this. Um, and one in, in particular, there was a, a lot of work done on looking at these images and both making, uh, doing computer analysis and making the images a lot better. And the other thing was by looking at these images and calculating what might be wrong with the optics. And so um, uh, some, some great work was done in that area. Jim Fienup, uh is the person who has probably become best known for doing that. So, you know, even though it was a disaster and it was a very expensive fix and um, uh, it, um, some, some very good technology did come out of it. So anyway, the, the bottom line, if you're going to use null optics or however you're going to test a spheres, it's always good to have at least two ways of doing the test, which Perkin Elmer did. And, you know, if the two test methods give you different results. You know, even if you are over budget and behind schedule, it, uh, you, you need to take the time to figure out just why they give different results and uh, determine which one is really right or maybe they're, maybe they're both wrong. But understand just what the, what the test results mean and, and uh, uh, why, why they differ. So what we're going to do, I think I'll stop uh, I have about five minutes left, but I think I'll stop at this point. What we're going to do when we come back here uh, bright and early Thursday morning will be to look at some conventional null optics, different ways of, of doing it, uh, making conventional null optics. 
And then we're going to go on and talk about the holographic null optics and the computer-generated hologram null optics. So any questions before we break? Question, yes. Adjusting the null optics for testing? Well, when they were putting it together, they had a little microscope uh, to get the spacing just right. They had a microscope where they were looking at a surface, and by mistake, they were looking at the wrong surface. And so when they positioned it, they, they put a different surface at the... They put surface B where surface A should have been, basically. It wasn't off by much, but it was off by... Uh, a little bit. Anything? Any other questions?